Hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming on Sunday afternoon. Hopefully uh, my next 40 minutes is not too boring. Um, I'm going to provide little bits of information um, that is hopefully enough for you um, to make some educated choices when you're doing your transformation program, but also implement it forever. Okay? Uh, a little bit about myself. So apart from uh, working at CrossFit here, uh, I work at Amy Stadium. Uh, I manage a, um, a elite athlete program for junior athletes transitioning into the elite athlete world. So we have 220 athletes that uh, range from sort of TAC under 18 cup AFL stuff, so future draft picks, to like AIS gymnastics, swimming, um, like Olympic sports. Kids who are preparing for Brazil and the 2020 games. Uh, before that, uh, I got started with strength and conditioning, I guess, through Olympic weightlifting. I did Olympic weightlifting while I was at university um, and a little bit afterwards, but I uh, decided you know, coaching was probably more for me than competing. Um, at uni, I started many uni degrees, as we all do, uh, or some of us do. Um, and when I decided to become strength and conditioning coach, that I would do exercise science, but um, throughout my sort of first year, I figured that doing something else would be probably more be beneficial to athletes and give me a wider uh, scope, so I chose psychology. So I did a uh, degree in behavioural science, majored in psychology. Um, what I focused on was health psychology. So health psychology is using, um, using psychology to affect the masses, to try and live healthier, you know, fight disease. Um, that sort of thing, helping doctors to get their patients to comply with their medication, things like that. So we see it every day, warnings on cigarette packets, things like that. That's all that stems out of health psychology. I completed a minor in exercise science as well because I needed some sort of exercise science to be known as a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, what I found using psychology and coaching elite athletes is that it's not creating, you know, minute specific eating programs, training programs, that sort of thing that makes them become the best athlete. It's habitual practice, consistency, doing the things that make them better, that continually yeah, takes them to the next level. So you can have a strength and conditioning pro program that's not like the best in the world, right? But you're still gonna get somewhere if you're habitual in your practice, yeah? So in our programs at Amy, we have a quote that says, we are what we do, we are what we continually do. We are what we do, I'm shocking it. Excellence, therefore, is a habit. It's a habit, which is a shortened quote from Aristotle, right? It's not an act, it's a habit. It's what you continually do, yeah? And the same applies to nutrition. One day of good eating is not going to make you healthy, nor is it going to make you lean, right? It's continually eating well, continually exercising, right? Being habitual that makes you a healthy human being, right? And eventually looking and feeling good, right? So, in nutrition, I always get asked, what are you, are you paleo? Are you zoned? What should I do? What should I do? Tell me what to do. Right? And I find that telling people what to do doesn't help them as much as coaching them. Right? Giving them information, having some sort of back and forth as to saying, well, this is what I can do. Right? And I say, okay, that's good. Unless it's really bad, that's when I tell them don't do that. <laughs> okay? So, you have all these different diets, right? What are diets? Diets are prescriptions. We've got zone, paleo, you know, books that have sold, thousands of copies. Right? What else have we got? Atkins. I don't know. Short. Someone like Tom McPherson has Brilliant. berries and whatever, yeah. Thousands and thousands of different sorts of prescriptions, right? All diets have common traits. They want to tell you what to eat, how much, 
and then sometimes when when to eat it. What to eat, how much to eat, when to eat it. As a coach or someone who looks after athletes, you need to sit back and even you guys now will hopefully be able to sit back if you read this, read that, or whatever, and say, what is it telling me to do? Yeah? How can I make an exchange with this and find out what's best for me? Right? What we'll do is we'll go through the what in basic nutrition, the how much of basic nutrition, and then I'm just going to touch a little bit on weight because that's when it starts to get a little bit more complicated, right? And not necessary information. It's good information, right? But you won't die if you don't know this one. Okay? If you, this just helps. When it becomes particular, particularly important is performance. If you're stri striving to be right up there in any sport, yeah, your nutrition, when nutrient timing becomes quite important. Okay? So let's have a look at what. What type of food to eat? What type? So, no matter what diet you follow, zone, paleo, Lee's special diet, yeah? All food group, all food are split into three groups. Macronutrients, right? You have protein, carbohydrate, so CHO is the shortened version of carbohydrate, and fat. This is an absolute truth. All foods are in one of these three. Okay? Now, in nutrition, we need to look at the hormonal responses to these foods. Because hormonal responses are what defines our health, right? If our hormones are imbalanced, and we're not just talking about like testosterone, we're talking about our base level hormones and then the hormones above those, right? If they are out of balance, you are going to be unhealthy, right? So we're not talking about fat just yet, we're talking about sickness, wellness. You will become unhealthy when your hormones are out of balance, right? Your immune system does not work as well as when your hormones are in balance, right? The major effector of hormones is food, right? So that is why diets want to control what you eat, right? So the hormonal response for carbohydrates is a release of insulin, right? The rate at which this is released, yeah, is actually told to you by the food on its GI level, the glycemic index, right? So loosely you have three types of carbohydrates. Low GI, moderate GI, high GI. High GI, insulin and blood sugar, right? Moderate, and then low. Pretty much straight. Okay? Bastardization, but that's about where we're at. Okay? High GI, we have a spike in insulin, right? Excess high GI, right, foods or excess consumption of high GI carbohydrates leads to this, right, all day. Yeah, and then we may go to sleep, we're fasting, starts to drop, but then we wake up in the morning, boom, have high GI again, okay? So what are high GI carbohydrates? And what does it matter if we have continual insulin spikes? Well, high GI carbohydrates, right, are things like sugar. I'm going to write it here, high GI. Sugar. So sugar, <laughs> glucose, on the glycemic index is 100, right? So the glycemic is 1 to 100. Yeah, sugar's up uh, at 100. Grains. Masters, breads, are we getting the picture here? Stuff that comes in a packet, like junk food, yeah? And as I told the last group, we can summarise this by shit food. Yeah? If we continually have this, this happening to us, our insulin levels are high, you are excess, consumption, right? We're going to get fat, we're going to get sick, and unfortunately our mental capacity diminishes, so we get dumber as well. So, if you eat like shit, you will become shit, you will become sick, you will become stupid, and you will become fat. Why? Well, insulin is a storage hormone. 
it signals to the body equals storage hormone. It signals to the body to keep and store nutrients, right? If you continually take in energy, right, consume food, take in energy, that is saying this, any excess energy is then going to be stored as fat, right? So, what have we got? Energy in, being signaled to store, store, excess, then equals fat. Yeah? Your body is telling your adipose tissue, store, store, store. Your fat cells being signaled to store, store, fat. Right? So, that's why, unfortunately, in areas, in Africa, poorer countries that are now getting lots and lots of cheap carbohydrates to dish out to people, yeah, we're getting fat. We're getting fat poor people. Unfortunate, but it's true. Right? The second issue we have with high GI or constant high GI consumption is that of fat, but what type of fat we're storing. So we can call insulin an activator, right? It's activating storage. And then if we are consuming bad fats, which we'll come back to again, so that's right, bad fats. Something like an overconsumption, mark my words, overconsumption, because you do need to have some consumption of something like this. Like overconsumption of omega 6, right, which is in vegetable oil, cheap oils, vegetable oil, sunflower oil, blah, 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 not olive oil, all the cheap stuff, right? Yeah, you're going to produce toxic fats, right? So if you look up this author, the zone, Toxic fat, he talks about it's called arachidonic fat. Right? These are the fats I was talking about before, where if your hormones are out of balance, we have a high production of this, plus we're failing our body to absorb it and store it. Yeah, that's when you start to get really sick. Precursors to cancer, precursors to st uh, strokes, etc. etc. So our increased level of this, toxic fat, arachidonic fat, right? Very bad. Now what can we do to combat that? Well, first we can eat low GI carbohydrates, right? Low GI carbohydrates, right? We can have a moderate release of insulin. So we're talking vegetables, veggies, and some fruits, right? Our low GI fruits. So a high GI fruit, banana, don't go crushing bananas thinking that you're going to save yourself, right? They are high GI, low GI. Then we can also consume protein for the release of the hormone glucagon. 